we will continue with our first part of the course which deals with the vehicles helicopters in hover vertical climb and also vertical descent so we are going to be looking at uh, we have already looked at one very simple model called the actuator disk theory so we got a very crude expressions for the thrust power induced velocity and so forth now we are going to go to a next layer of uh, sophistication so we are going to go to a next uh, level of theory called a blade element theory so let me switch to the full screen more so you could see a little bit better so we will be looking at this uh, particular topic what is wrong with momentum theory why do we need another theory it was a pretty good theory it gave a rapid back of the envelope estimates of power the first homework we will be working on you'll be using basically the momentum theory or the actuated disk model to compute the hover ceiling of uh, three helicopters european helicopters and comparing their performance with published data published data to see whether you're getting close enough answers if not what what's causing the discrepancy you'll be looking at those type of things the blade back of the envelope theory is sufficient to initially size a helicopter for example let's say you're first starting a helicopter project you just want to know how big is going to be the rotor how big is going to be the fuselage how much power does i need do i need do i go with a single engine helicopter or two engine helicopter you know what type of engines do i use so you want to make a lot of decisions so you don't want to get bogged down in the details of the blade design structural design and so forth so the back of the envelope is su sufficient for the early stages of conceptual design if you will like pretty much an artist's rendering of the vehicle you can then start talking to the engine manufacturers and so forth to start getting ready for the engines because they take a long time to custom design if needed and deliver on time but it does not tell you what happens if you go from three blade to four blades or four blades to five blades number of blades is not accounted for it doesn't take into account what aerofoil you're using NACA double 12 aerofoil or NACA 23 or 12 aerofoil or a Sikorsky 1095 aerofoil or a VR7 Boeing Vertol aerofoil doesn't know all these details it has no idea how much lift these aerofoils are generating how much drag they are producing in you know in camber line nothing is known at this point also our actuated disk model does not care about the blade platform shape is it a rectangle is it tapered is it a swept how much of the root area is cut out for the hub so how much is the remaining blade area that we were working with also it doesn't take into consideration the blade twist and also doesn't take into consideration any Mach number effects, compressibility effects, and so forth. So when we go to the next level of sophistication, we want to remove some of these uh, discrepancies, some of these things we didn't consider. So that's what the blade element theory tried to do. It still assumes a uniform induced velocity all over the rotor disk, like our actuated disk did. So that's one thing in common. It uses the same induced velocity expression from the actuated disk theory. Remember the induced velocity is square root of thrust divided by 2 times density times the disk area per hour. So it uses that piece of information from the actuated disk model. Other than that, it allows the things to vary from root to tip in a radial direction, as well as the chord, sweep, aerofoil properties, compressibility effects, twist you name it so this was proposed by uh, uh, Drzewiecki in 1892 other people in, in particular Glover and others have improved it it's what you call a strip theory basically you take a blade break it into slices span by cuts span by strips then on each strip you find how much thrust I'm producing, how much power I'm producing. Try to bring in the local cross-sectional information such as the blade 
blade characteristics, airfoil, taper, twist, cord, local Mach number, whatever information is there. Compute how much thrust it is producing, how much power it is producing. Then sum up over all the strips you get for one blade. Then you multiply by the total number of blades, you get the total thrust and total power. So this is in essence is what blade element theory is doing. If these functions are analytical, you could do analytically, back, uh, you know, then you get a back of the envelope result. But if these functions are complex, then you'd have to set up a spreadsheet strip by strip. You have to compute the things and then add them up and then add them together. So we will be doing homework number two using the blade element theory in a little bit later on. <coughs> so to repeat it, you take a given blade, which is called a reference blade. We, we, we know that some of the real estate is in the root region called the root cutout area. Let me see if my cursor can be seen. The root cutout area is between the shaft axis and the inboard section of the blade. <coughs> so you have all kind of stuff like the shaft, hinges, flapping hinges, lead lock hinges, pitch motors for pitching the blade up and down, or a pitch links for pitching the blade up and down. It doesn't matter. Lots of uh, gunk is there. So we, we, the blade does not start there. Blade starts at uh, some kind of a cutout region or a cutout area, typically 10% to sometimes 5% uh, of the radius. Then it goes all the way up to 100%. So you take the real estate of the blade, divide it into small segments of slices delta R or dr. Each dr produces some small amount of thrust dt. It consumes a small amount of power dp. So if you integrate dt and dp, assuming it can be analytically integrated or definitely numerically integrated, you sum it up over all the strips from the cutout region, root, all the way to the tip. This is just for one blade. Then you multiply by the number of blade B, then you get the total thrust and total power. So this is the basic principle behind the blade element theory. This has been used for aircraft strip theory. Uh, we have seen uh, people have used it for propellers, uh, Glowert and others. Now we are going to be using for helicopters. So let's take that uh, typical section that I'm showing in here. It's at a distance R from the axis of the shaft. So the shaft is spinning at an angular velocity omega in radian. So this section is going into the plane of the paper at the velocity omega r. This is the planar velocity, you know, in the in the rotating disk plane, it has got a velocity omega r. So this is the typical airfoil at that section. If you look at the horizontal velocity component, that's the in-plane velocity, which is called omega r. From airfoil theory, we know that a given airfoil is defined by a chord line, which is a um, line joining the nose of the airfoil and the tail of the air, trailing edge of the airfoil, leading edge of the airfoil and trailing edge of the airfoil. I have that written it as a dotted line called the chord line. Now, if the airfoil is cambered, if the wind is coming along the chord line, it will still produce some lift because the body is asymmetric. One side of the airfoil is different on the chord line, above the chord line, compared to below the card line. But if you keep changing the wind direction, there'll be a one particular direction, which is called a line of zero lift. If the wind is blowing along that blue dotted line, then the airfoil produce exactly zero, zero lift. So that's called a line of zero lift. So coming back, the plane of rotation, the airfoil is moving at a velocity omega r. Perpendicular to the actuated disk, you have the climb velocity, capital V, plus the induced velocity, lowercase v, that we saw in our actuated disk model. So the angle between the vertical component of velocity and the horizontal component of velocity is phi. Phi is tan inverse of the vertical velocity, which is v plus v, divided by the in-plane component of velocity, which is omega r. Now the theta, 
is made of geometric twist. That means the blade is twisted during manufacturing process, plus any pitch rotation that the pilot is given. And in this theory, we assume that the theta is measured from the plane of rotation. That's where the omega or vector is there, the horizontal axis, horizontal line is there, all the way up to the line of zero lift. So that's the theta. Now the effective wind velocity is not along the omega or direction, it's not along the v plus v direction, it's the vector sum of omega r and v plus v, so it's the hypotenuse of the triangle. So that's the uh, total velocity direction. Therefore the angle of attack alpha would be, is neither theta nor phi, but it's theta minus phi. It's the angle between the total velocity direction and the blue dotted line. So theta minus phi is the effective alpha. So once you know effective alpha, if you know the aerofoil table, lift versus alpha, CL versus alpha, CD versus alpha, either from uh, experimental data or from CFT or from some, some computer programs such as XFOIL, you can easily look up the CL and CD lift coefficient and drag coefficient. So this is the first thing you would do in the blade element theory is as soon as you are given a blade, at each section, you'll find the effective alpha. Now, the lift is one half rho times velocity squared times C times CL. Okay, that CL that we talked about. What velocity we have? We have uh, two components. One is tangent shoot to the rotor disk, the, that's omega r, in the plane of rotation, that's omega r. UP is vertical or perpendicular to the rotor disk, which is V plus V. So UT squared plus UP squared is the total velocity squared. Quad times CLs. Notice that now we can account for the wing taper. We can account for experimentally measured characteristics of CL and CD. Okay. So this produces delta L and delta D. Small amount of lift produced by a strip per unit span, per meter span, same way small amount of drag produced by that strip per meter span or per foot of span. These happen to be normal to and along the total velocity vector, which is the hypotenuse of the triangle I have shown in this picture. So that means delta L is not in the plane of rotation and delta D is not, uh, uh, me, delta L is not normal to the plane of rotation. Delta D is not in the plane of rotation, but it is tilted as shown here by an amount phi. Therefore, we have to use some uh, vector calculus, uh, vector vector rotation. So delta L times cosine of phi will be the vertical component contribution to delta T. Delta D times a sine of phi will be subtracting because it's pointing downwards. So delta L cosine phi minus delta D sine phi is the thrust per foot of span. If you multiply by dr, that's the actual thrust, okay, in pounds produced by that strip of width delta r in the radial direction. Now delta L and delta D, we have already seen it plug it in there, then you get this expression. How about the horizontal component? Delta L is tilted backwards, so it's going to produce delta L times sine of phi contribution along the delta Fx direction. Delta D is also tilted backwards, but it's got a smaller angle, so it's going to be cosine of phi times delta D, where phi is usually a small number. So this is the dfx. Again, if you plug in for delta D and delta L from the previous slide, you get this expression. Why do we need delta fx? Because if you multiply that by ut, then you get the power consumed by that particular strip. Now it's all over except the shouting. You can integrate dt, multiply by the number of blades to get the total thrust, integrate dp, from, up, uh, from root cutout to tip, multiply by the number of blades, then you get a total power. 
So this integration may be done numerically in a general case because the card is a, some numerical value. CL and CD we are getting from some table lookup. Phi is numerically computed from this table, to this formula. So we will come up with a spreadsheet-based approach and we will use that in our homework number two to look at the Howard performance of a rotor and compare it with measured data. Okay. But um, for simplify, simplify, simplified geometries, we can make some assumptions and uh, simplify it. So we are going to first look at how do I simplify it, what type of assumptions are reasonable. So I'm going to show the assumptions we can make in the next slide. So we will assume the chord is a constant, that means it's a rectangular blade. We will also assume that the blade is linearly twisted, that means the theta is linearly varying from root, which is the root cutout, all the way to tip, nothing fancy. We will assume that the induced velocity is small, climb velocity is small, tens of feet per second. Therefore, v, small v plus capital V is much smaller than omega r. Therefore, tangent of phi, which is v plus v divided by omega r, is very, very small. Therefore, cosine of phi is 1, sine of phi is just phi, which phi, by the way, is capital V plus small v divided by omega times lowercase r. Lift is a simple linear A times alpha. Alpha effective is theta minus phi. A is a lift curve slope. So we can write it as A times theta minus phi. For low speed cases, A is 2 pi without viscous effects. 2 pi is 6.28. But if you have a viscous uh, boundary layer thickness and so forth, changing the airfoil, A would be slightly less we would normally use 5.7 in many of our back of the envelope calculations. CD is small, so we keep CD times cosine of phi, but cosine of phi is 1, so it's just CD. But CD times sine of phi is neglected because sine of phi is phi, phi is a small number, CD is a small number. CD is 0 0.01, phi is very, very small, small number times small number may be neglected. Like also, omega r is much larger than v plus v. So where we have omega r squared, which is ut squared, plus v plus v within the parenthesis squared, up squared, up squared can be neglected compared to ut squared. So if you make these assumptions, then rho is a constant, it comes out of the picture. C is a constant, it comes out of the picture. <coughs> ut squared is omega squared times r squared. Omega squared comes out of the picture. <coughs> a times alpha, a comes out of the integral. Alpha is theta minus phi. Phi is v plus small v divided by omega times lowercase r. That stays inside the integral. Then that r squared inside the integral that we see for the thrust comes from the omega squared r squared term which is ut squared. In the case of power, you get a Cl times sine of phi. Sine of phi is phi. Cl is A times theta minus phi times V over omega plus V over omega r plus Cd r cubed. Okay. Uh, the A should be in front of the front uh, first term here. You know, I, I have a small error. So let me go ahead and uh, fix that particular slide, please. This A should be in here. This is A times theta minus phi, that's Cl, times sine phi, which is simply phi, V plus V over omega R, plus C D times cosine phi. Cosine phi is 1, C D is kept in here. Okay. So this is the expression for P. 
Why do we get omega cubed r cubed? Because omega squared r squared comes from ut squared. We pick up another omega r because dp is drag times omega r. So force times this velocity. So we pick up omega cubed r cubed. Before we could integrate this, <coughs> everything is constant here. Nice simple function of r. r r constant 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 but we need to plug in the expression for theta if the theta is a very simple linear function e plus fr this is called a linearly twisted rotor then we can plug in for the theta here theta here and we can analytically integrate the expression for the thrust and the power okay. so i will let the let that as an expression for you so when you do that, you'll get uh, this expression for the thrust. Notice that we get uh, expression E plus 3 fourth of radius times F. That's the theta at 75% radius. So 75% radius, which is sometimes called a blade pitch, because that's, that's what appears in this expression. So very often, when they mention the blade pitch in helicopter community, they will refer to it not at the root, not at the tip, but at 75% radius. Okay. What is this lambda? Lambda is capital V, which is the climb velocity, plus small v, which is induced velocity, divided by omega capital R. That's the lambda. So this is the total inflow ratio, which, is, which includes the climb inflow ratio, which is capital V by omega R, plus induced inflow ratio, which is lambda i. Now, bc over pi r is called the solidity. A is a lift curve slope. Lambda is v plus v or omega r. v over omega r is called lambda climb. This little v over omega r is called the induced inflow ratio. Combined together is the total inflow ratio, or simply called the inflow ratio. So this is the CT. You could likewise integrate the CP power. And then if you non-dimensionalize the power after some a little bit of algebra, we get the induced power plus profile power. You may recall we got the same expression from our actuated disk model. Thrust times induced velocity. So lambda times lambda i times CT is the induced power in hour. Then we added the profile power, you may remember. Okay. So this is what we get both for linearly twisted rotor and for another rotor type of twisted rotor is called an ideally twisted rotor. This is a nonlinear twist. Near the root, it's got a very high amount of twist. Near the tip, it's got a low amount of tips, the twist. Okay. So if you use this relationship, you get a different expression for CT but you get the same expression for CP as we got up in here. Right. This expression does not include a swirl losses, does not include a non-uniform inflow because we are assuming the inflow is uniform, lowercase v. In reality, it varies from root to tip. And also, we are not allowing for swirl losses. Therefore, it's usually corrected Rather than using this as the figure of merit, we use kappa. We put a kappa in front of it, kappa times lambda times ct to correct for non-uniform inflow, swirl effects, and also the tip losses. We will cover those things in a later set of slides. This is the induced power. This is the profile power. Lambda is the inflow ratio. Sigma is the blade solidity. If you have a high solidity, you'll have a lot of power consumption because this term becomes very high. So if you have a large number of blades or wide card blades, big blades, a lot of drag, a lot of profile power, a lot of power consumption. On the other hand, if you have a skinny blades, you have other bladder effects that will happen that we will talk about here. 
So let's look at the expression for the delta t, which is one half rho, u t squared, which is roughly uh, simply omega r squared because u p squared is small, times t times c l. So let's say that c l is a constant, some kind of an average value, so that you could bring this c l outside the integral. C can be brought outside the integral. Rho can be brought outside the integral. Then all you have is r squared dr that produces r cubed over 3. That's a 1 half. It becomes 1 over 6. r cubed, when you apply the limit, becomes capital R cubed. So this is the thrust with the average lift coefficient. Therefore, the CT is thrust by rho pi r squared times tip speed squared. Plug it, plug this divided by rho pi r squared tip speed squared, you'll get solidity times average lift coefficient times 6. Therefore, the average lift coefficient is 6 times the thrust coefficient by sigma. So if you have a skinny blade, so short card length, fewer blades, then uh, sigma will be small, then the CL will exceed stall lift coefficient, your rotor is going to stall. So you need a large enough sigma solidity, typically between 0 0.05 and 0.1. So high thrust means you need a lot of solidity. Lightly loaded helicopters means you could get by with a light solidity. So the solidity will typically vary between 0 0.05 and 0 0.1. That's, that's normally what the modern helicopters usually use. Now, the figure of merit is the expression we saw earlier. This is the ideal power. This is the actual power in hover. In hover, lambda is square root of ct over 2, so you could put it in here. Now, ct can be expressed in terms of cl. Then we see we have a cl power 3 half, cl power 3 half, cd naught. If you divide through everything by cl power 3 half, then you'll get CD naught over CL power 3 halves. So if you minimize that number, the denominator will become small. Figure of merit will be maximized. So the best way to maximize the figure of merit, in other words, minimize the power consumption, is to operate at a lift coefficient all over the rotor so that CD naught, which is the average drag coefficient from root to tip, divided by CL 3 half, which is the average lift coefficient from root to tip, is uh, minimized. So we conclude our momentum theory here. Next, next lecture, we will improve it using a theory called braid element momentum theory. At that point, you'll be ready to do homework number two. Then you'll be ready to do quiz number one.